So we're going over effective digital marketing plan for your shop this year. Um, we'll give a we'll leave like another minute here before we get started. Have a few people, maybe a few stragglers jump on in. I'll do my best to keep track again of Q and A. Actually, I'll open the chat box. All right. Well, we will get this party started. Um, if you could throw one in the chat, if you're good to go, uh, that would be perfect. But yeah, I think regardless though, even if you don't put a one in the chat, I think we're, we're going to get going here. So again, yeah, today we're creating an effective digital marketing plan for your shop here this year in 2024. So we'll be going over different avenues of marketing and kind of how you want to get that ready, ready to go. And if you're not doing it, then hopefully this will be a good resource to make sure that you are prepared that way. So house rules, again, for those of you that maybe haven't been on here before, um, just turn off your microphone, throw comments in the chat or the Q&A. Um, either one will work. And as those go through, again, we'll do our best to answer those because you, you're taking time out of your day um, to join me here live. So I appreciate it. And so I want to make sure that I, I give you that time back and, and answer any and all, and all questions that you have. And so what we'll cover um, are going to be concrete steps to implement into your shop's marketing plan. And so we'll be going over some of these kind of higher level things, so understanding your audience and, and what that sort of looks like there, key components of a digital marketing plan. Um, so what kind of makes up a digital marketing plan, those different phases, leveraging social media. And so now a lot of shops aren't able to leverage this quite the right way. And so we want to go over kind of our, some of the, our, our go-tos in, in that media. And then SEO, so search engine optimization, will trickle into a little bit of Google ads and then text message marketing strategies. So kind of the bread and butters of, of online marketing here that we'll be going over um, all holistically today. So hopefully you all are tied in and ready to go. So first question is, does your shop have traffic or uh, but not enough leads? So if that, if that uh, makes sense for everybody, does your shop have traffic but not enough leads? So if you wanna throw in the chat, yes, yes or no in terms of traffic versus leads. Okay, some people say, I don't know. Uh, we have a couple of no's. Um, yep, so we will say, yes, they, have, they do have traffic, but decent leads. So, okay, perfect. I mean, it's good to know. I mean, obviously everyone's in, in different places in time with, with their shop. So this will be a good place to be able to, to allow us to start. So who, first and foremost, to get the right lead, obviously we need to understand the, the target market, the ideal customer. So who, and who, who that is. So. During this process here today, we're going to define what that should be at your shop in terms of an ideal, in terms of an ideal customer. Okay, so understanding customer needs and preferences comes down to kind of these three different areas. So we have functional needs, convenience needs, and financial needs. So functional needs are going to be more in terms of, say, like you do a good job of, of repairs. So you, you do the the need of the car is broken and you fix it. So that'd be a functional need. Convenience need would be you offer a loaner vehicle if, if, if the vehicle is going to be is going to be there or um, you your speed of, of delivery. I mean, you, you can do same day appointments, something like that. And convenience, financial needs, obviously, um, the price point and the value that that proposition that you bring to the table is is, is what it's going to be kind of complementing that financial need of the consumer. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of functional need, convenience need, and financial need. Because in terms of those three, that's how we're going to be going through and looking at um, how we can define that sort of target customer in the area. So things that kind of answer those needs are going to be specific features or attributes, tailored experience, or easy communication. So um, specific features would be maybe you offer high-tech diagnostics or, or certain things that other shops don't that require kind of a certain level of ability that, that most others don't have. So that'd be another good, a good way to kind of, again, we're, we're going to be talking about unique service propositions would help set you apart from the rest that then also answer those needs and problems of, of the consumer. Okay. Tailored experiences is going to be a lot around customer service. And so um, having a very good customer service experience can set you apart regardless of the ability of the repair. Granted, you want to have the utmost ability of repairs, but what, what I like to break down to that experience a lot too is like Chick-fil-A, for example. Like, yes, they're obviously the, re the result, they're 
their food it is good. Like I, I personally enjoy it. But what, what sets them apart is the level of service, the level of communication that they're able to bring um, to the table. And that, that consistency to know that what's being brought is going to be there every single time. And the way that's delivered is delivered that way every single time. And so it's very tailored. It, it feels very unique um, of, of an experience every time you go to that. And if you can build that around your shop, that's a, a very ideal situation. And easy communication. And so this is in, in terms of whatever mediums work most for individuals these days, which would be texting. And so having a platform that allows co consumers to, yep, very easy to drop off. They can text you on the phone, let them know like, yep, these are the things that are going on, sending pictures, sending that DBI, things like that. It makes it very easy to communicate with the consumer in, in a medium that they prefer. And, because, and nowadays, a lot of people are uncomfortable on talking on the phone, unfortunately. And so we need to make sure, though, we can't judge them for that. We need to create a medium that meets them that in, in a place that, that they're comfortable with. So those are going to be big things that you want to make sure that you're kind of setting yourself apart on now against, against the competition to answer some of these different problems that your ideal customer is facing. So... These are some examples, again, as I, as I go through um, of, your, of your ideal customer, but I want you all to think about exactly who that is. Because when you understand who your ideal customer is, you can speak to your ideal customer consistently through your brand and, 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 and through the imaging and the way that your employees are presented, everything across the board. Because you understand them and you can easily calm any pain frustration that they have right off the get-go. So demographics of a, a, a typical ideal customer that we have, so a homeowner, 35 plus years old, probably maybe 35 to 60 range. Um, and typically maybe it's the female that, that that's coming in because and, and occasionally the male, maybe an understanding that split of male, female cons, um, customers is actually really important to understand because if you have maybe a heavy female customer base, maybe there's certain ways that you want to present yourself online. That's going to cater to women coming in and making sure that yes, it's, it's safe and, and it's clean and everything like that. Grind, for either female or males, you want to make sure that's presented. But obviously, the, between the male and the female, there's going to be certain things that are more important to the other. Um, so you want to make sure that you understand that who's coming in most often, how we're presenting everything across the board. Um, also, they're maybe they're married with two to three kids, and these kids are older, so they have cars, and those cars are at home. So you're taking care of three, four, five vehicles of that family in, in the household. Um, they have a median income. Maybe under, understanding what what they're bringing to the table as a household income. That, that's making an ideal, um, their family oriented, reliable. So those are things that easily, yes, you want to write down together. You can see, maybe filter in your whatever shop management software that you have in terms of like, okay, who are our most frequent visitors? Who are spend, who's spending the most? What do they all have in common? Because we obviously love working with these people. And so then you can start to drill down like, oh, this commonalities, this is probably our ideal customer persona. So it makes it a little bit simpler there if you just leverage the reporting that you already have in your system. Okay. And the pains and frustrations that they deal with. So maybe um, understanding from your service advisor, or if, if that's you yourself, that's the one speaking with the customer, you would know like, okay, what are people constantly complaining about on the phone or what is constantly wrong that, that they're maybe worried about or um, their hesitancy to come in or whatever it may be. So obviously car not working is going to be a, a common pain and frustration that they're dealing with. Um, or some people can't get an auto repair shop on the phone or to return their call. Some people are just very bad on on the phone. Some shops are. They're just they're very bad also following up. Their things are too busy. Phone lines are jammed up or whatever it may be. And again, they, they can't. They're not able to properly get to everyone that they need to. You do not want to fall into that pain of frustration. Um, they need to get a car issue resolved like immediately. Obviously, that certain ways that are urgent. Um, too busy to deal with the car is a, is a frustration of them. But they know they need to get it done and worry that they won't have a car for a while. So that that's where things like roller cars and rental cars, whatever you may be doing, that helps alleviate these pain and frustration that comes into play. Because as you hear these things, you're like, how do I solve this problem for them? And then creating a process around how that problem can be solved. It can go a long way. And as these two things complement each other, then, I mean, everything starts to fall into place. So it's going to be a lot more smooth sailing from there. Okay. Any questions there? I hope, I hope not. I, think that, I hope that's pretty straightforward. Hopefully you all... Um, have a customer avatar and if you don't and if you're watching this uh watching this replay hopefully you're going through this and seeing that yeah these are some good generalities but the, the more specific you can get obviously the better um because then that helps dictate the the messaging that you have 
Um, so we have a question. Could our idea customer be a range of people or should I target one? That's a, that's a great question. And so, I mean, it all depends on really the goals of the shop. So for, for the most part, targeting just one is a little too siloed, um, in, in my opinion. Probably, probably whatever that one customer is, you won't have enough of them and, and thus where you won't be able to keep the shop busy enough. So I'll, I would most likely pick a range in, in terms of like what some of the ideal customers are because not, may, they may not be the same. They may be slightly different, but ideally we, you can still communicate to these different individuals, maybe through different marketing campaigns. They don't all have to be siloed into one specific one. So those are just um, important to know and, and understand. It's a great question there. So then additional fears and implications um, for a cu uh, customer thinking about going to any shop. So being ripped off or overcharged, it, it could be something that they're worried about paying too much for something they could have gotten elsewhere. That's a common thing, but also it could lead to um, customers just, just, just because, again, th this is where you want to lean into the fact that you're you're not a race to the bottom. You're, you're not the cheapest shop in town, nor do you want to be. It's like, do you, would you want to go to the cheapest hairdresser to cut your hair every single time just because they're they're the cheapest or would, would you want someone that's bringing you value that that's making you happy that's making you, like again you you want to make sure that advisors are trained in, in, in that end to really relay that hey what we're bringing to the table is a lot of value um but, and yes it's not the cheapest but you'll be very very happy at the end of the day and obviously coming back so having card damage by faulty workmanship so people have experience and we bad experience with other shops Having to wait for days the car for the car to be done. So maybe the uh over promise, under deliver sort of thing of saying, Oh yeah, we can get it done tomorrow and it's tomorrow and it's still not here. A week later, still not there. So making sure that you under you probably understand how long something will take. Um being inconvenienced, trying to coordinate with transportation afterwards. If maybe you don't provide uh commuter vehicles or you don't provide a lift or Uber ride, um, something like that it can be painful for them to deal with. And and building more than they can afford. And so that could easily be a fear, but answered with like financing options. Um, and then goals and desires, we got get the car fixed, have the issue behind them, having a well-kept car, taking care of their family, more income, money, wealth, driving in a nicer, more luxurious car, maybe kids healthy, happy, spending more time with family. So yeah, just knowing what, again, some of, some of these are very, very, very general in terms of the goals and desires of your ideal customer. But yeah, again, as you as you start to write down, you start to make sense and understand. Like, oh yeah, I'm, we're a lot alike in terms of our goals and desires. And so, if I want this and, and I like the imaging this way, then more likely they like the imaging this way, or whatever it may be. You just want to put yourself in their shoes, and it'll overall will help your marketing campaign in tenfold, hundredfold, um, if anything. Okay. And so, so key components of the digital marketing plan. And so now that we have the ideal customer, now we need to set up for the plan to execute and capture these ideal customers to come into the shop. So setting clear objectives and goals and the content strategy of what that should be. And so digital marketing is all about connecting with your audience in the right place at the right time. And so we want to make sure that you have the consistency built out in just different avenues of, of marketing, not just maybe one specific avenue, you have different avenues of marketing. So that way it just kind of, kind of feels like you're all over the place for them and they can't help but feel like, oh, I need to give them a try because it seems like everyone's going there. So you want to create that feel, create that vibe through um, different strategies and goals that you have. And a lot of that is going to be online because everyone spends their time so much online these days, especially on their phone. All right, and so this is what we call our, our digital dominance method in the sense of the different aspects of online marketing that when they're locked in, uh, new customers are coming in and more importantly, they're coming back, increasing that lifetime value of each and every customer. And so these are definitely the aspects that we're kind of talking about, as you can see at a high level today. Um, and in other webinars, we talk specifically just about one thing in particular. Um, but yeah, throughout this year, we'll have very, very drilled down specific things and Maybe it gets a little bit more on the technical side, but we want to definitely give everyone the tools if they are able to do it themselves or have someone that's working on it for them and at least arming you with the right questions to be able to ask. Those are things that we want to be able to present to the table here. Okay. So leveraging social media. So the social media is, is another avenue I think that is not nearly as leveraged as, as well as it should be. Um, it's hard to understand also ROI behind social media. I hear this so much from auto repair shop owners. It's like, well, how, are my posts even making a difference? Like, what, what, what is 
what is the impact that's happening? Like no one's really saying that they're coming in because they saw my Facebook posts. Like, yes, I, I, I agree. Um, but it's all about that consistency because you don't know how many times they maybe saw a post on their feed and like, oh yeah, I, I saw that. There was a gym's auto repair that, that, that popped through again. And it, like their branding is consistent every time. And then one day like, you know, I, yes, I, I, need, I need to go grab my, my, my brakes. I need to get, need to get replaced in my vehicle and I, I need to go to gyms to, to go take care of that just because they consistently saw that. But naturally, then they go to Google to look up, okay, how do I call them? And then, and then when you ask them how they heard about you, they say, oh, I heard about you through Google. But really, it could have, it could have easily tracked through, through social media. So it's really hard to see that direct impact. But the more consistent you are, the better off you'll be. Because if you do nothing, no results are possible. So that's that's usually my take in terms of social media and leveraging it. But we'll go over some tips in terms of... Um, how to theme out certain days and, and how to make that consistency with both posts to sort of make an impact. So choosing the right platform first and foremost is very important. So understanding where most of your, your customer audience is. So in our in the auto repair industry, for the most part, Twitter or, or X is, is pretty useless um, in, in terms of like, hey, yeah, making their status posts for the shop and whatnot. Maybe if you have a decent following, it, it can it can make a big impact, but no one's really going on there to see what the auto repair shop has to say and, and, and be updated by it. That's just not not a thing that, that's going to take place on there. So majority of customers, if you're going to see ROI, is going to typically be from Facebook or Instagram. And then at times, if you have, you can build a platform through YouTube because video is getting more and more prevalent. And so building a strong YouTube platform, maybe you're just going over how-tos and, and basic almost DIYs of how to do it, but at the end of the day, you know, most people are not going to do it themselves. But then that you're now you're kind of labeling yourself as the expert in that field. And so people would know that they can trust you before even going in. Because it's like, yeah, I've, I've seen all the videos that they have, all the different things, and I need one of those things. So why would I not go there? So those are different ways that you can leverage that app. And then a video can easily be leveraged in short term in short form video in terms of on Facebook and Instagram as well. So just understanding that and where even the age demographics are. I know I get questions on TikTok and people are like, oh yeah, should I make TikTok? It absolutely doesn't hurt to, to create the platform. But again, the audience range on TikTok is fairly young. And so most of those people are not going to have a vehicle or have the monetary funds to afford a, a decent repair on, on said vehicle. They're just kind of there for more entertainment purposes. So that's where, again, understanding where your your ideal customer is and it'll help you understand what platforms you should go on and, and things like that. Okay. So let's keep going. So yeah, I guess I already answered that. I touched on the gun slides. Um, so yeah, so for our pair shop, visually oriented platforms. Um, let me move myself. Well, video learning for platforms can prove to be the most effective. So as, as you already know, so that's why we kind of leverage these main, these main three, four, for auto repair, like social media, and what will be the most viable. Okay. And so some of the content creation strategies, these, these are some of our go-tos. Granted, everyone, you can just having different styles or you can have more engagement around your current staff and, and what you're doing there. But I think these are, these are some of our go-to highlights that we like to make sure that are achieved within your social platform. So a really good one is a before and after showcase. It's a little bit tricky because at times it's like, okay, how do you tell if a car had an oil changer? Granted, you can, you can show people having, having work done um, like from one place to another Maybe you do a spot clean after the, the repair is done, things like that. It just shows improvement. Um, but usually it's going to be more along the lines of bigger things that are that are taking place. So um, bigger repairs. So that, that way you can visually see that a real difference was made. So taking the picture maybe of really, really bad breaks and then showing brand new ones that are on there. The big, the big uh the big difference that takes place there are really good before and after showcases that you can label having your brand kind of on the image. It's a good way to leverage that. Um, educational content is going to be more in the forms of like, yeah, like, like the common problems of, of vehicles or it could be how to's. How to's obviously dance the fine line with DIY and not always do you want DIY people to come. Um, but again, you want to show that expertise as much as possible. So having any form of education, at least in my opinion, is really really valuable to be able to share because it doesn't hurt to be able to also share service orientation with other people and showing how you're giving back just through knowledge basis so that's my my two take in terms of educational context i know 
that people have different different opinions about that that side of things. Um, customer testimonials and reviews are humongous, and so to I know sometimes people get shy about. Oh, I feel like I'm bragging about the customer testimonials, and you are, and it's okay. Like it, it, it's it's okay to share that you have amazing people that love coming to you. You want to be able to relay that because you never know who else is going to see that and be like, oh my goodness, why why am I not going there? A step further that I always I recommend to people is is start to make like short form video, vertical video, asking people that are typically after they're really happy why why they, why they like coming in to your shop or um, what they find uh, as the most unique thing about it. Or just, just again having quick video forms are very very beneficial and create this sense of community that is coming to your shop consistently because people will recognize people and have, as you. Maybe you make a goal that I want to get one a week or I want to get two a month or whatever it may be that that's going to snowball and add up. And eventually it's going to start to feel like people, oh, I have a few friends that go there. Why am I not going there too? So it could be a very, very beneficial avenue to leverage if you haven't already. I know it's hard to, to fork out the time to do video, but definitely I think a, a recommended thing that um, I would suggest everyone, everyone does. Um, and then last one is engagement and community building. So Anytime you do things within the community, share it. Like without a doubt, it doesn't matter. Like I, how you like, I don't want to be that person that has to video myself doing something charitable. But it's very, very important to share that you are helping the community because if you don't, no one knows. And when people know that, no one's like, oh man, I wish he didn't. He didn't share that. Like no, they're going to tell you, oh my goodness, congratulations, or thank you so much for for doing that for us. Like again, those are things that go a long, long way. Maybe you don't do it every single time, but it's important to share and realize how much you are supporting the community, how you're all in supporting everyone, because that kind of comes back to you in, in tenfold. So do not hesitate. Do not be shy about sharing amazing achievements that you're doing to help others, because. Again, when that when that's seen, that will always get reciprocated back to you. So those are kind of our go-to highlights. You can kind of theme each day of the week out this way, or maybe you're doing you're not able to do as many a week, and so you kind of theme out a couple of days a week of that of this kind of thing. But just to give you an idea of what can be posted on social media, there's other things like highlighting employees that are in there. Um, you can, like I think I hit probably most of. Of the points you can take pictures of just cars that, that, are, that are coming through and maybe some really cool ones that, that came in that day um that that gets people's eye so things like that um are very very beneficial so any question any questions there hopefully that hopefully that's helpful so if that, if that was uh, kind of helpful tidbits of theming uh if you can throw a yes in the in the chat or if you're watching this in the replay throw a yes in the comments um that'd be greatly appreciated so all right let's keep going so next we have SEO. So uh, SEO for those that don't know is search engine optimization. Um, it's it's the uh, Google voodoo as, as, as some people say, um, but it's very, very important to, to rank well locally and um, for both your website and more, most importantly your maps to appear in Google because majority of the traffic, majority of the calls guarantee are coming from your local map listing, your Google, your Google business profile. Um, and if it's not, then probably there's a lot going wrong in, in, in your SEO if, if that's not the avenue that that people are are tracking with. So I know a lot of people ask me like, okay, what is even the importance of the website? No one's really no one really goes on it. Um and yeah, be, and yes, the, the the visibility on on websites are fairly low and the amount of time they're on it are fairly low as well. It's like a couple of minutes at most. So but the main reason you want to have a robust website with a good content is just to build that trust with Google then kind of points back to your local Google business profile that helps you rank better again and obviously brings more, more results. Um, a question about social media. So how long should social media videos be? 30 seconds, two minutes. Great question, uh, John. So I typically say keep it within that 30 second to a minute window. So the biggest reason for that is within, uh, within ads for social media, the best ones that work the best are within that 30 second to one minute window. Sometimes it caps it off at one minute and it kind of cuts your video short and, 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 and puts it in different places. So the within that uh, amount of time tends to be that that sweet spot. If you can get it even shorter than that, like because yeah, everyone's attention span is so short these days. Like if you can just hit home the money points within a few seconds, so you get a 15 second video that just knocks it out, just boom, boom, boom. They they hit the topics of like how great you are. 
perfect. Don't, don't be like, Oh, I need to just talk a little bit more to make this 30 seconds to a minute. No, like obviously people's time is kind of so short. It's a short one. Fantastic. But yeah, I'd say if you, if you had a goal for time range, I'd do 30 seconds to a minute. So thank you for, for asking. Um, YouTube shorts will make about 60 second unless video, the 30 second video is good for that too. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the, the, and in terms of yeah, SEO, like I was talking about, website is prevalent to drive more power and trust for Google than help your map listing rank better. So that's that's the big ways that they're they're interconnecting because Google does rely on the trust that's there to show that you have authority, show that you have expertise in the area. Because um, if if not, then more than likely um, someone else will take that spot of ranking better and, and building that trust with Google. So what is SEO? Um, kind of already talked well, talk, about it. Like you jumping over uh, the slides before it, before it goes up and you pay attention to what slides coming up next. Um, but yeah, so again, it's going to be all for visibility and ranking local searches is the most important aspect. Um, and even at times user experience, but like I mentioned, for the auto repair industry in particular, it's not as many people are going through the, the website itself to have a good experience. There usually is a lot more urgency. So there's a lot more call related to the, the conversions. Yes, there's a good, great online booking appointment tools that then create a very effective user experience for the website for that short time frame that I highly, highly recommend. Um, but in terms, in terms of uh, the overall aesthetics of a website, clean, simple, but then having the right content is what's going to be um, the winner at the, at the end of the day. So, and then keeping track of your, your local map listing is gonna be very crucial. So seeing kind of year over year trends. So sometimes people see it from one month to another, like, oh, that's a big drop. What in the world's going on? Is my marketing company doing anything? Um, it's, it's it's tricky to, to display it from a month over a month period because there's this natural seasonality. No month is ever the same. So that's what, but comparing it year over year to the same month in the given time frame usually allows for uh, a lot truer comparison. And so you'd ideally wanna see some good increase jumps there um, in terms of impressions, search volume, clicks, things like that. There are um, overall impressions have, have gone down a little bit throughout throughout this past year going into this new year. But regardless, there's still a lot of a lot of searches to be had, a lot of wins to be had. So um, but just want to make sure that that is a an aware and prevalent thing. Okay. So keyword search. And so in order to properly rank in an SEO, you want, you want to make sure that you're going after the right keywords. And so if you are a do it all shop, if you, you do all makes and models, that's where you want to go after some of a lot of the more general um, repair words. Because again, when those people call there, you can cover them. It doesn't matter what vehicle they have. Um, and those will also be like the auto repair, the car repair mechanic, um, and then some of the general services that, that, that people will search. Regardless of if you also focus on specifics, specifically say on just American and Asian or just on Euros, like you still want to have those general terms because your makes and models are still, they don't know to only type in the Euro make and service. Um, they, they will type in general searches too. So they, there's a factor in that you do want to rank for those two. But in terms of time convenience, you, you want to make sure that your, your page is a little bit more focused on exactly what the makes are that, that you do service and making sure Google understands you as like the thought leader, the expert on those different makes and models. So that way, when those do appear, without a doubt, you're the one that ranks high on, on the local search. Okay. So there's different tools out there, even free ones. Um, one good one is the Google Keyword Planner, where if you just you can just type it in Google and type in Google Keyword Planner, um, it allows you to do some keyword research in terms of just like general terms in your local area, gives you at times estimated search volumes. Those search volumes are yeah, hit, hit or miss, but um, if you have questions in terms of kind of what those words are in your local area, um, just let me know. I'm happy to search those for you, send, send you over a list of what, what that sort of looks like in, in your given area. But it's important to know what words are the, are the go-to ways. So that way, if you're building out ad campaigns and things like that too, especially that you're going after the right words, you're not um, going after maybe low impression words that aren't going to get many searches. And then you're calling and being like, why are we not getting enough leads coming in? Well, it's because three people searched that term the whole month. And so you want to make sure that you're understanding what you should be going after. Okay. 
So there's a difference between on-page SEO and off-page SEO. Uh, so we, we like to break it up um, here in terms of SEO and what, what how that delineates. So on-page is going to be everything on the website. So things on the content, the image optimization, the meta descriptions, tags, schema, things that Google is reading technically on the website. So the, the, and it's important to have good, good clarity there and uh, good expertise in, in your content that's trustworthy that will help again google read those signals right the proper way that then points back you ideally want to have some good internal links that then allow some natural funneling within the website but then also things that point back to your map listing itself because again like i mentioned in this industry that's where majority of the traffic comes from so you want to make sure there's good things that are naturally pointing back to the map listing to help it rank better so there's different ways that you can do that online but there's also um, another thing where we split up again SEO until there's off-site SEO, so off-page, and this is where it's built up of what we call backlinks and citations. And backlinks are going to be those blogs or articles on other websites that then point back to your website. They'll have a link on there that they click on the word or phrase and pops up your your website. And Google loves this because now it's like other websites are sort of referring you. So they're a lot harder to build because you need to know the right people to get things on the certain websites, um, or whatever is the right tools but it is a very, very effective uh, a pattern to be able to use there. So I wanna make sure that um, you guys understand the difference difference there. Um, someone asked a question, what keywords should my shop be using generic to auto shops or specific to my location? So I, ideally you, you can use a blend of both. So, I mean, so specific would be auto repair, Salt Lake City, Utah. Like, the, like having having the having the actual location of where you're at, the actual city name of where your shop is, and so that'd be a little much, and that helps you understand a little bit more generally of where um, where you're kind of overall ranking in, in your in your giving community. Um, if you're if you're in a little bit more rural area, obviously there'd be a few more cities that you you want to be optimized for, not just the specific one that's tied to the address of where your shop is. So it's important to understand that aspect, how you're ranking, who the competitors are, and then going from there. Okay. So hopefully that answers, answers your question. Sorry, I missed that one. That was a little bit ago. But local SEO now is going to be talking about your Google business profile, your map listing. Um, and again, any reporting that people share with you should be showing your map listing data. If it's not um, in this industry, I, again, I, I feel like that does, does you an in-service because like majority of the call volume and the traffic that's happening is, is coming from there. There, should, there. There's going to be ads on top of that. There'll be, there'll be, yes, there'll be some organic website clicks, but majority of the traffic is going to be coming from your map listing. So it's like, how well is that performing? That's where a lot of the, a lot of the SEO should be driven at the end of the day. So understanding the local keywords, local link building that does there, leveraging the products and services within the map listing, um, responding to reviews the right way. Uh, that, that that come through those are all kind of compounding factors into helping you rank better locally so it, google loves when you leverage their product and so making sure that you're you're posting in there regularly um usually i say once a week is good enough um in terms of their product um, and then again that just gives them more data points more signals that hey look at me pick me to rank high in the maps so those are things that you want to definitely leverage and do um Local keyword. Yeah. So yeah, I think that, that hopefully that covers everything in terms of like kind of the high level of, of local SEO and how I should look at it. But most importantly, go into your Google Google business pro profile analytics and start understanding and seeing what traffic is coming through. Or if a marketing person is running yours, have them send that to you so that way you can and that way you can start to understand if unfortunately if they don't under like have that for you or understand it, then I'd be a little bit worried in terms of like what ways are they helping supply the right traffic for you because again that's where majority of the traffic should be it, it shouldn't be anywhere else at this point probably 70 75 percent of, of the traffic will come from your local map listing okay awesome and utilizing google reviews so i mentioned this already um having the most google reviews will not mean that you rank the highest I think many of you that watch this will know that because you have the most reviews in your area and you're not always number one. And that 100%, I mean, if, if that's all it was, then there would be a lot of people just trying to slam reviews in there, probably a lot of fake ones, and like that's how it would rank. So Google knows that those things kind of happened before. And so it kind of 
that's a great assault and so like there's other obviously other pointers and things that helps to understand the trust to rank you better but it definitely helps to get you into that top three and then when you're in that top three having the most and best reviews definitely doesn't hurt i mean if you're any any industry if you're if you're looking up a restaurant you're, you're not going to go to the one that has three uh five star reviews versus oh this one has 1763 reviews and it's like a 4.8 star like obviously that's going to make a difference in terms of that, that appearance there so even if one was ranked above the other so that's where you want to make sure that you're having an avenue to create to get good google reviews and also not just getting the google reviews at the shop like at the shop, Google will see where the reviews are coming from and sees that, oh, yeah, they're getting it from the shop. Good. We'll rank them good when people are searching at the shop. No one's searching at the shop. <laughs> You're, you should be already ranking well in terms of standing right outside your shop. Um, it's going to be when they're at home. So that's where you, you want them to leave reviews when they're at home. Um, and, and that way it kind of creates this these indicators for Google of like where people are coming from. They're leaving the reviews from here. Um, it gives a, a lot better data points. So that's where I, I'd highly recommend leveraging um some sort of platform to get those reviews that way. Okay. And then make sure you respond to the reviews. That's another thing where you're in you're in Google's um, product. You're using getting more data points in there, respond to reviews with keywords, and uh, it, at the end of the day, it'll help rank more efficiently, more uh, a lot better. And now we go into Google Ads. So there's a lot going on with Google Ads. Lately, within the last probably the last few months, in terms of things that Google is doing to be a lot more loose in terms of the the contingency that you typically set in place for a Google ad campaign, um, allowing a lot more probably spam related calls to come through. So there's a lot more headwinds on that end for most for most marketing companies to deal with. Granted, it's something that we need to fix and and, and deal with ourselves, but kind of putting up more walls for for Google to like not assume things that it shouldn't. It's kind of being a little bit loose with the restrictions and both in terms of keywords and in terms of location parameters. Um, but Google Ads is a great way to get quick wins. So SEO is a lot more long-term process. Gradually, it takes a good amount of time. Depending on where you're located, if you're located pretty rural, it could be quick. If you're located in a high urban city with lots of other shops, it could take a bit. So understanding that, knowing that, yeah, it's gonna take some time, but Google Ads, no matter what, can help you win as quickly as possible if it's set up the right way. So emphasis on pay-per-click is just, you get to show up at the very top. You can show up as often as quickly as possible when, when creating that, that account. Um, but there's a lot of intricacies in terms of the ad campaign, making sure you're using the right terms. Again, do, do that keyword research, um, but also making sure it's not too broad, not too general, um, and allowing Google to be too loose with where should, things should go is really important. So kind of takes a constant honing into, um, increasing what's called negative keywords to disable the, the list a little bit, drill down, help Google understand that no, I want these specific things to come up in a search and then that's the only time that should appear. Um, a big thing to also have though is some way to track conversions or track the leads that actually come through the ad. Um, a lot of times they're, again, if, you, if you're funneling things to places that have the same number as other ways that people can reach, like if they have the same, on the mailer, there's the same link that then goes to this page and ads goes to this page and organic can go to this page. It's hard to delineate what's working the best and, and where you should be investing maybe more money. So it's important to understand where, like how well your conversions are performing, what the cost is. And so if you were to increase or decrease budget, what that does to your conversions is that if that's something that you want to be the outcome. So those are very, very important things to track and understand. Um, when when building out a Google Ads strategy of what that should be. So typical cost per click goal right now is around that six or seven dollars to creeping towards ten dollars cost per click as a for, for effective ones. Granted there's some campaigns that you can get much cheaper than that based on where, where, where you're located, but right now holistically across the board, that's what it's looking at. Cost per conversion and cost per lead is looking like around that 40 to 60 goal mark is, is what typically what we we try to make sure we shoot for. Um, but obviously not every lead is true. So the true cost per lead can probably be between that 50 to $100 mark of, of what you're looking at, um, just based on how the campaign is, is, is being built and, and the effectiveness there. So yes, things have gotten more expensive on the Google Ads side of things um, in terms of, of a lead basis, just um, how, how things currently are. So just understanding what sort of budget needs to be built, what you need to be investing in to then obviously get the right results is really important to, to understand. 
Um, and yeah, this is our, our wheel again of, of everything that we've hit. And then last, lastly, I want to chat a little bit about text message um, marketing. So if you're not, uh, I guess I will just leave it in the comments. Like, are, are any of you leveraging text message marketing of any kind? I'm just want to throw a yes in the chat here. Or yes, in the comments, if you're watching this on the replay, or you can just type in text message marketing. How about that? If you're if you're watching that in uh, on the replay, then um, that way I know kind of where where people are at. Um, so here we've got some some yeses, we got some noes. So for sure, I think it's very important if you are a no that you leverage text messages uh, of some kind. Um, we got uh, there's a, some good platforms out there. Leverage one, try one. Hopefully, it works for you. If not pivot, choose another one. But you want to have some means of texting communication with your um, your customers because they they want that. that. That's how a lot of people work, um, where they feel the safest to be able to respond. So you want to make sure you offer and create that avenue. Um, allows for follow ups to getting Google reviews, appointment reminders, uh, decline service recommendations, things along all along those lines. You can just all leverage all through texting. Um, there's a lot of rules in, in regards to texting, making sure you get approved to do to do marketing for it. But once you get those things approved, follow the rules, you're good to go. And um, you get a lot more customer feedback that way through text than versus say if you do if you still do email marketing. A lot gets left unread or a lot goes to spam. So yeah, this, you, you want to make sure that you're leveraging this the right way. And so messaging that that works. So some unique service propositions that work. You're gonna pick up a drop-off, loaner cars. Straightforward pricing up front. So those are all things that you want to um, go through and look at um, in terms of like having it also be there in in your overall messaging, both via text on your website, everything across the board. So timing. So I get I get this question pretty often in terms of like how how much is too much in terms of texting. If you start creeping in the feeling like yeah, it's probably too much, then I, I would agree <laughs> that you probably. You too much was a, little, was a little bit sooner than that. Because uh, think about like if you were to get texts from a business, how many texts would you want to see from them um, reaching out to you? So kind of think think about that fine line. What we typically recommend is yes, you have that text follow up, but there should be no more than that one touch point in a given month. Whether it's for like they came in, you followed up with them, or they haven't been in a while and then you're reminding them or you have a Monday promo that went out. You like don't have multiple things going out at one time, all at one time. It's just going to inundate them and they're going to get annoyed. And you don't want your customers to be annoyed just because they're getting too many text messages. So I want to make sure that um, the timing there minimize, like whatever you think it should be, probably go one step lower than that and keep it, keep it there. Um, maybe ask someone, another marketer, just like what, what should it be? This, this gets different ideas. Um, but yeah, you do not want to be too over the top now in regards to like when you're doing appointment reminders and those things, like obviously you want those touch points to definitely take place to make sure they come in. But then yeah, that, that follow-up sequence, make sure it's not overwhelming. Um, we usually go with the rule of like, well, we will do one follow-up text if we don't see a, see a response, typically in regards to a Google review. But after that, you're, you're done. stop texting them. <laughs> you can catch them in the next go around when, when, when they come back. In. Okay. Analyze and adapt. So understanding the engagement and tracking that, having seeing seeing customer feedback. Maybe not everyone is going to be ecstatic with with the service. So always asking and why and what can be done better next time can go a long way. Um, so yeah, just having ways to analyze and then obviously execute changes from said feedback. So, yeah, I think that those are a lot of the main points. And so as we as we go through um, kind of highlights of what we talked about, first and foremost, you want to understand your audience. So but before you do anything and creating a plan, create your ideal customer, understand who they are and write that down. Um, so that way now you can get to the point of like, okay, let's create a plan of how to execute to bring these people in. So then you create the plan like we talked about different marketing strategies that are across the board. I recommend dabbling with as many of them as possible. So you want to be as well-rounded, hit different points, focusing on one at times can be very risky, especially if it's not working because then you have no other avenue to rely on. Um, social media is a great thing that can be leveraged. That I think is underutilized within the industry. And so making sure that you're actually engaging and speaking with the audience is, um, is huge there. SEO for those that, uh, Maybe you are unsure what that is. 
and how it's effective. Um, it can be very effective if done done right, but it needs to be done consistently um, in terms of different things to sort of feed Google, all right? And then text message marketing that like we talked about. So any other questions um, from, from anyone today from the, the webinar? Again, I appreciate you all being here. Um, I'm grateful that you guys take the time out of your days. I know um, I don't take it lightly. So if you have any questions, please, please reach out. Um, we have different avenues to reach out um, for those that may be interested. So regardless if you're here live or if you're if you're watching this replay, we do free strategy sessions where we analyze what you have currently going on with marketing. We'll look at, maybe we'll particularly have some different suggestions and things that can help benefit. And then at the same time, if you see it as um, us as a, as a good fit and a good partner, we can go over that as well too. But mainly we want to go over in terms of like what you have currently going on and what can be improved. Uh, regardless of if it's us executing the plan or your current vendor executing the plan or a different vendor executing the plan that, that you're switching to, um, having the right resources can be very, very beneficial to understanding what needs to be done there. Um, we have a free marketing checklist as well, um, just a basic checklist to go over some of the things that you want to make sure are involved with your online marketing. So if you go to go.liftautorepairmarketing.com slash marketing checklist, you will find that, um, that checklist there. You can print it out or... Uh, pretty sure it's an online PDF. And so you can just, you can even live check into the boxes too and, and save that online if, if you would like. Okay. And then we have a Facebook group. Um, I think we're at like 1,500 auto repair shop owners in there sharing tips and tricks. Um, for us, obviously we run it. Um, so we will have different marketing things that are trending, things that pop up from Google as, as we get announcements and things that we feel prevalent. We'll throw it in there just so people are aware of what's going on. Maybe why, oh, why did I get so many... Uh, spam Facebook messages uh, this, this week. We'll, we'll explain, we'll give a rundown exactly of how to disable those, limit those coming through. No matter what, those are going to come through. But obviously, I mean, we just dealt with that huge wave of bad messages that happened well, probably a week ago now that has definitely slowed down. But if it hasn't slowed down, let me know. Um, or I continue the video that I did in, live in our Facebook group of how to walk through like different settings you can apply to your Facebook business page to limit those kind of things. Okay. And yeah, and then we also have a book, Drive More Business, which is right here on my shelf, but you can buy it on Amazon. If you just type in Drive More Business, it'll be, uh, this this little money car will be on, be on the cover. Um, we made it about, oh, it's been a year. It's been a year now since, since, we, since we made the book. And so um, maybe we'll come up with another one here in a year, in a year or two. That's more prevalent than marketing is ever changing, but it's a step-by-step -step guide that walks you through um, everything, online marketing for your shop. All right. So uh, I don't see any other questions. So if if you have questions, again, feel free to reach out to me via Facebook. You can give us a call here, 877-733-3446. You can email info at Lyft uh, or you can book a, call, uh, a strategy session straight through our website. Whatever works best for you. Um, I want to make sure that we're here for you. So, but again, thank you so much. I'm Kelsey with Lyft, Auto Repair Marketing, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks. Bye.